Wow, what a shot. Hello everyone, my name's Kai Zamet. I'm a director, cinematographer and writer. And today, thanks to you guys, I get to watch my very first World of Warcraft cinematic, Wrath of the Lich King. How these videos work is I break it down into two parts. The first part is I watch and give you my reaction to said medium. The second part of the video is I look at it again as a filmmaker. I break it down, cinematography, video editing, overall story perhaps, whatever it may be, hopefully by the end of today's video, you'd have learned something or seen a glimpse behind the curtain when it comes to storytelling and filmmaking. Just to let you guys know, this video is sponsored by the lovely people at Atlas VPN. And thanks to this channel, I can get you three months extra for free. But a little bit more about that later on. Let's get on with it, shall we? Play the tape. Blizzard Entertainment. Do you know what? With these Blizzard cinematics, I've not been disappointed once. They are absolutely amazing. Wow, what an opening. My son. Or like an opening shot. The day you were oh, his legs are the frozen. The forests of Lordaeron whispered the name. Oh, a voiceover. Arthas. I like that. That's very cinematic. Black text on white. Nice vista. That's cool. That soundtrack. Wow, what a sweeping shot. What's that? My child. Stunning. I watched with pride as you grew into a weapon. That's beautiful. Look at that. Righteousness. Wow, what a shot. Remember, our line has always ruled with wisdom and strength. That's lovely. Look at that. And I know. You really nice step of field. When exercising your great power. What's he done? What was that? Is this an enemy or is this his? Ride. Oh my god, look at that. Is that a dragon? That's amazing. Wow. I got goosebumps off that shot. But the truest victory, my son. Is stirring the hearts of your people. That's amazing. It's so epic. Oh, these are these people, are they? For when my days have come to an end. Not the enemy. You shall be king. Yeah. Wrath of the Lich King. Just before we go on to the filmmaker's breakdown, let me tell you how I'll get you those three months extra of Atlas VPN. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount, an 85% discount. It's the best VPN deal in the market. This summer deal gets you Atlas VPN premium for $1.83 per month and an additional three months extra. It also includes a 30 day money back guarantee. Be quick as it is a limited time offer. Get your deal by clicking the link in the description below. Atlas VPN is a virtual private network, which makes all your internet traffic travel through a protected encrypted tunnel. This way it protects you from spying, Wi-Fi dangers, and it also hides your IP address. Atlas VPN protects you from malware, pop-up ads and all the other nasty things on the internet. My favorite thing about using Atlas VPN, other than feeling safe online, is the ability to view content which is specific to another country. This is how I get access to films and anime on streaming services like Netflix. Actually, here's an example for my American viewers. Rick and Morty, I know it isn't available in the US Netflix, but in the UK where I am, it actually is. God save the king. You can use Atlas VPN on pretty much any device, so Windows, 
Apple, iOS, and Android. So again, this summer deal gets you Atlas VPN Premium for $1.83 per month and the additional three months extra. Not to mention the 30 day money back guarantee if it's not really your thing. But you've got to be quick. As I said, time is running out, tick, tick, tick. Get yours today by clicking the link in the description below. Wow, that was amazing. Really powerful. As I said, it gave me goosebumps. That was just like well, that one shot, the dragon, instant goosebumps with the music. Yeah, that was that was uh, that was fantastic. The opening shot, it's not an establishing shot like we'd normally get a vista, a landscape. It's a character, it's very different. But what it means by having the character as the opening shot, it, it emphasizes that this story is all about this character. You've got that long dolly shot going forward. So the dolly shot being the camera moving towards the subject. There's a couple of things why this works really nicely. By having it nice and long, it gives us two things. It allows the voiceover to deliver the story, my son, and give us that backstory. But visually, it gives us time to process all this information about this character. His armor, look how cool he looks. He's also frozen to the chair. They used a fade transition to bring us closer to the subject. If it was a harsh cut, it would have pulled us out of this lovely storytelling moment. The camera's dollying forward, and then a fade transition, and then the camera's still continuing to go forward. Again, if it was a harsh cut, it would have really pulled us out of the storytelling moment. It was a really nice, slow fade in. And by doing that, they gave us that delivery of the line, didn't they? And that was his name. Arthas. Just before that shot finished, you had the cracking of the ice. We heard it and you visually saw it. And what that did is it planted a seed in our heads that he's getting up. Because what they did there is they did a flash to white. If we didn't see, if we didn't see the cracks and all hear the cracks, and they just did a flash to white, storytellers, we use that to tell the audience that we're having a flashback scene. Well, normally that's what it means. And because they used the cracks visually and the audio again, we understood they plucked the seed in our brain saying, oh, okay, this flash to white isn't a flashback scene. This is him getting up. Finally, we get our establishing shot. We understand now where we are as an audience and this lovely snowy vista that we can see. Establishing shots don't always have to be at the very start of a film. Normally they are, because again, we wanna tell the audience where we are and what world that we're in. If you don't show an establishing shot, you can confuse your audience members. Directors may do this if it's part an integral part of the story as in they want to confuse their audience members. But yeah, you will always normally get an establishing shot at the beginning or somewhere in there because we want to tell you where you are. And again, and I emphasize what world are in because at the end of the day, this is world building and you have to have that. You have to see where you are to, to understand what, what world you're in. And then with that lovely vista, we're taking it in. We're looking at all this snowy landscape. The foot comes crashing in. By having that foot come crashing in, it supports the visual language that this character is powerful. The opening shot, the camera was looking up at him. It gave us that powerful presence. But to continue that, the foot comes crashing down. Okay, this guy's powerful. But not only that, we've gone to a landscape shot. We need to bring it back to the character. And the foot comes into shot. We're then, okay, we're back with the character. He then starts to walk. And then we've got that lovely transition fade to black. The cut to black or the fade to black, should I say. What's the importance of that and how did they use it? By having a fade to black, what they've done is they've allowed us to continue the story. What you normally find is a montage in films to show the passing of time. But in this case, we can't do it because it's a short cinematic, it's a trailer. So what you do is you use your blacks to emphasize that. So by having a fade to black and we see the character moving, we know in our brains that he's continuing on with his journey. If it was a cut harsh to black, it would be like, okay, well, where are we going now? But by having that lovely fade in there, that transitional fade, we then know he's continuing to go forward on his journey. Then we've got this powerful character development. We see him grow. See, that may sound strange, we see him grow, but hear me out. So the character, he wipes the ice. We understand that he's got to do something. He understands that he has to do something. And at the same time, the soundtrack has got this lovely singing, this voice of a child singing underneath as he wipes the snow. He looks on at this ice, what he's got to do. He's contemplating of what he's got to do on his journey. And then he raises his head very sharply after having that beat of thinking. Again, that contemplating. He knows what he's got to do or he knows what he must do. As he acknowledges what he's got to do, you hear the voiceover come in. 
my child. My child. Stunning. And then the song, well, the voice of the child singing then fades away, it goes away. The voiceover tells us that he's watched him grow as a weapon and then it cuts to a weapon. What I like about this voiceover is every time he says something, you visually get the backup of it. I've watched you become a weapon, the voiceover says. You then see a weapon, he draws a weapon. You're hearing what he is and then you're also visually seeing, you're getting that supporting evidence, he is a weapon weapon comes out. That whole section for me, it was just amazing. What incredible storytelling, the growth of the character, the singing choir or the child singing in the background, showing us we're growing with him. He walks to his, what he must do, he wipes the ice looks at it, he has those moments, those character beats of reflecting, again with the child singing. The voiceover telling us the growth of him becoming a weapon. Just that whole section is incredible. Yeah, I'm, I'm really inspired by that moment. That was just, that's one of my favorite bits that I've seen in ages. I've also got to speak about the lighting in this section because it was absolutely stunning. This character looked amazing. So the character himself was always backlit in this section. So the light is coming from the back. And why is this really important? By having your characters backlit or just anything backlit, your subject, it's very cinematic. It lifts production values. Having your characters backlit, you know, so they're wrapped by the light. It's very, it's like a velvet, it's very visually appealing. It's, it's just lovely. Camera movement and camera positioning. How is this utilized within the film? From the opening shot, that, other than the dolly shot going forward, as I've already mentioned, the camera was looking up at this character. From the moment this film started, I understood immediately that this character had a power status. But why did he have a power status? And the reason he had a power status is because where the camera is shooting up at him. By shooting up or framing your characters up higher than you, it gives them power. And immediately, as I said from the opening shot, he had that power. If we were to film on the same eye level as him, or we appeared as the same level as him, he wouldn't have that presence that we've seen in this cinematic. So by framing him from the waist up, so shooting from the hip up, if we're looking at him, there's a power struggle between us, the camera, the viewer, and him. But he looks far superior because we are always looking up at him. And that's what a power struggle is. It's the power struggle between two characters or us visually looking at them. And in this case, he looks far superior. When the camera shoots down at him, normally means someone is weaker. We don't get that because of what's happening around him. It's part of the story. Something is under that eye, something is under there, and we know it's part of the story. Again, supporting his visual power, that visual narrative. When the camera tracks back really fast, when he's put the sword into the eyes, we're still looking up at him, even though he's on his knees, he still has, he still continues to have that, that power status. Another thing about that shot what I really like is they roll the camera off as it comes back, just to emphasize the power, that it's almost like he's knocked the camera off its axes. And I love that, it's just, yeah, the camera goes back really fast, it rolls off its power, and then the smoke, or the, sorry, the, um, the snow, comes up towards Carrie. Yeah, it's such a it's such a really cool shot that is. With epic character reveals, be it human, monster, or in this case a dragon, you tend to do body part reveals in shots of three. So we see part of the character in bits, well, again, in shots of three, before we get the big reveal. How this cinematic does it is we have to see the character and how this new thing in the world affects him. So he's there in the foreground, this big thing, large thing, in our case a dragon, comes out the back but we don't quite see what it is yet but we understand how it affects the world and the character that's in it then we get our shots our body shots of three and then we're back to the first shot my favorite shot in probably the whole film other than the dragon reveal at the very end it comes crashing out of the ice and then we understand the relationship between them how this again this dragon affects our character but it was such it was so beautifully done it was slow motion he's in the front it was out of focus it was such a cool epic character reveal, or in this case, a dragon reveal. I, I loved it, I thought it was fantastic. Just to build it up even more, the dragon walk into the peak, that whole section, the music rises, it builds with the dragon, and then it's that epic moment of the wings open, and it fully comes to a crescendo. That bit was just so good. Oh, it's amazing, I love it. It's just, oh, so good. What I like about this part is the story flow and how the dragon introduces us to the army. The dragon leaps off the cliff and flies over the army. Instead of cutting the camera, a harsh cut to the army, we follow the dragon. There's that 180 pan 
straight over the army it, it then follows the thread beautifully and that is getting us from one place to another place or a character to characters or whatever combination that it may be you just you're following that thread within the film to get us from a to b on a lovely smooth flow on, on a roller coaster ride basically the vo again he comes in he tells us something part of the story we again we see it we've seen this throughout he talks about my child we see his child he talks about him becoming a weapon we see a weapon he's now talking about his people we see his army the voiceover in this case is a very much a voice of god he's given us that information in this case they're backing it up story wise visually as well we hear it we see it and lastly we follow the thread back to our main character we go from his army up to him where he's looking down at them talking about camera position earlier on i said if you look down at someone they can appear weak in this case the camera is looking down at him but he doesn't look weak and the reason being is because he is looking down at someone else we can visually see in the scene him looking down even though the camera is behind him the camera quickly tracks around where it does an orbiting shot around him quickly returning him to his power status that upright camera position from the hip looking up at him immediately his rightful status this powerful character where he should be and how he should be framed what i love about this part is the voiceover and his delivery and he says you shall be king and as he says that the character there's a nice close-up of the character he looks up and he looks out towards the horizon and what i really like about that is as he's looking out it visually tells us is he is looking at his future he looks out you hear the lines you shall be king that's my future and there you have it that was my thoughts and reaction on the wrath of the lich king i really hope you enjoyed today's video guys and if you did give it a thumbs up as it really does help out the channel and would you like to see some more well over there i've gone and put another reaction video for you i'll see you next time Bye bye